Okay. Is it uh, full screen now? Yes. All right. Very good. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a real treat to always uh, get back together with uh, Professor Mystery. I don't know how, if you realize how fortunate you are to be in his tutelage. He had uh, left a big void at Georgia Tech when, when he left us here, and I always cherished my interactions with him. He's one of the best uh, theoreticians in um, and minds in this field. So the um, topic that I selected for, for us here today uh, is a little bit um, of an outlier compared to the work that we usually do. Um, our expertise is in um, the overall vehicle design, system of systems design. But this opportunity came along a few years ago uh, while working for the Navy and the Air Force, the Navy was envisioning the uh, creation of um, a next generation uh, a warship uh, that uh, it was cutting down the mining requirements by automating everything inside and creating a vision of Star Trek Enterprise where um, there are sensors everywhere. You sense that the, the ship has been hit and you uh, automatically figure out how to reconfigure yourself to avoid any catastrophe. If the chill water, for instance, is disrupted for so many minutes, all the electronics will pretty much fry. Uh, and after years of working on this problem, we realized that we never have seen any real data. And um, we were starving for access to, to data that we own, that we can manipulate. And uh, in one casual discussion with the chief business officer at Georgia Tech, it turns out that Georgia Tech, courtesy of the Olympics, when Georgia Tech was hosting, they have equipped quite a few of buildings with uh, advanced technologies and sensing. And it was for more or less, you know, for show for the Olympics. And the data wasn't really being utilized in earnest uh, to, to do any type of optimization or improve the efficiency. So we signed an agreement that we will work own their problem and in the process learn from them and, and perhaps help Georgia Tech run this campus more efficient. And that creates for a very good use case when uh, you can see something from beginning to end with actual data and it's not philosophical at this point. Uh, we had access to every aspect of the problem. So um, I was briefly introduced. I have been at Georgia Tech here for 41 years. I'm a Regents Professor in the School of Aerospace Engineering, and I also have a Distinguished Professor position with NASA Langley. And um, I have been in charge of the um, Aerospace Systems Design Lab uh, since uh, the 1995. So a few words about the lab, and then I'm going to move directly into this initiative. And in the end, I will tell you a little bit about opportunities in research, since most of you are researchers. So that way that can stimulate your uh, enthusiasm and excitement, and perhaps um, that might lead to future uh, opportunities and collaborations. So the place that I'm representing was created in 1992. Um, it's home to uh, 250 researchers. Oops, uh, I think it's moving by itself here. I'm not touching anything, hold on. Okay, so there is a group of, um, 250 researchers. You know what? I wonder if it's on some kind of a timer. It's advancing on its own because I'm not touching anything. Okay. All right. So we funded in 1992. It's a group of 250 researchers. Uh, 50 of them are full-time. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Olivia, do you have any idea? Is there any um, automation in this thing? No, there shouldn't be. Um, do you want me to try to share my screen and see if we're yeah. running? Yeah, okay, okay. Because it seems like it's advancing the slides on me. You know? Here, I'm yeah, I'm stopped sharing it. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, give me just a second. Yeah. So anyway, I'll tell you a little bit of the story. Um, so 250 researchers, 50 of them are full-time researchers, like a research faculty people beyond their PhD, 
and 200 masters and PhD students supported from 60 active uh, different areas of research. Uh, usually the funding comes in from NASA, the Air Force, uh, Office of Naval Research, uh, DARPA, and then in terms of industrial uh, participation, we have about 50 different entities that were collaborating. Um, there are seven centers of excellence. Uh, the latest one is in Siemens in um, this area of digital engineering. And in fact, a lot of these opportunities that Dr. Fisher is gonna to talk to us about in the end are actually directly linked to this uh, opportunity of collaboration with uh, Siemens. And of course, Siemens is always looking for good talent, you know, from around the world to go work either here in the United States or, or, in, or in Germany. So, yeah, so those are the slides that talk to this one. So if you move, uh, Olivia, to the, the next one, number six, maybe. So that's how we're set up. So Dr. Fisher is actually in charge of the digital engineering. So that's why she's here with us today. She's the lead for that uh, division. Um, so the, the, the purpose of the digital engineering division is to uh, support the development of the next generation methods and techniques that uh, kind of work in this domain of cyber physical systems, you know, like the nexus of physical and then uh, computational systems. That is usually achieved by integrating models and data sources across disciplines and functional layers. Usually we're trying to create some kind of decision-making environment so that uh, it supports decision-making. Um, trying to develop and leverage advances that have been made in machine learning and artificial intelligence capabilities. In fact, there is a program at Georgia Tech on computational science and engineering that a lot of those things are now part of their curriculum. So a lot of our students will take courses on, or they be co-advised between the, the two departments. And then the last bullet, we have a series of open-ended problems that every student that goes to our graduate program has to pick up one system and one system of systems, grand challenge. And usually what that is, it's an open-ended problem that they will have to figure out how to solve. And then there is a committee of people from within Georgia Tech and outside that they guide them through, through the process. Let's go to the next slide. So since we're mentioning this word digital twins, I thought we probably should give a definition here. And of course it's an emerging field. So, so these definitions, uh, if you read multiple sources, you will find different potential uh, descriptions. But uh, digital twin can be viewed as a, a set of, uh, of virtual information constructs that mimic the structure, context and behavior of an individual or a unique physical asset is dynamically updated with data from its uh, physical twin throughout its life cycle and forms uh, decisions that realize value. So there has been a, a, an attempt, uh, Farouk, at AAA under what is called the digital engineering integration. And they have come up with some uh, interesting um, um, philosophical perspectives. The Air Force has been espousing it for the last few years and trying to approach uh, the problem from every aspect of, of engineering. So if you look at the little diagram on the right, you're trying to create a virtual representation of a connected physical system. And then depending on what phase you are, it could be a discussion about the as designed, then the as built and as the as used uh, perspectives. And again, the cartoon over here is kind of showing that you might have a a physical asset, the one on the bottom, and the virtual asset can be something that when you're designing it, it doesn't yet exist, so it's a for forecast. And then after the building is built, or the aircraft, or the ship, or whatever it might be, you're creating a representation that coll continuously collects information and data, and you can play games with it and um, foretell what the future will look like without having to actually do it or and observe it and and perhaps that may be a very costly uh, proposition. But the next slide. So these digital twins occur at different scales. And uh, in this example that we're gonna be discussing here today, since we had the data, we, you're gonna see three perspectives, a campus wide, which will be a macro level perspective. And then we're zooming in into a specific building that uh, 
Uh, Art Blank from the Home Depot has donated to Georgia Tech and has some very peculiar uh, requirements placed on it. And then one level below that might be the human activities inside those buildings. So if you put the next slide. So as we started working with um, the chief business officer, it, be became it became evident that there are close to 200 engineers and probably Oklahoma has something similar that, that they're responsible for making the campus run. And very rarely, there is a relationship between us researchers and they. And the more we got into it, we realized that they have their own ways of thinking. They have their own tools. In many cases, they don't develop their own tools. They buy them from someone. Uh, in many cases, they rely on other people to do the studies for them, architecting firms or uh, integration firms. So as we started looking into this problem, we realized that you can look at the entire system as a series of networks. And these are layers that you see on the left-hand side. You have human activities, the built environment, the energy, the water, and on and on and on. And all those things need to be integrated or at least harmonized. And then you map them into the environment. And in this case, Georgia Tech has as a goal sustainability. So they were planning to balance the economic, social, and environmental aspects subject to the fact that the system has to be resilient. So for instance, there's fluctuation in energy costs from day to day, from week to week, month to month. And they wanted to determine what um, it is that they should be buying and when. As an example, if you buy electricity the day that you need it, it could be easily a hundred times uh, more expensive, a thousand times more expensive than if you have uh, locked in the cost months in advance. The other one could be, um, let's say, weather threats. So for instance, if there could be a thunderstorm, a tornado. Um, in the South, you know, they care a lot about the temperature. So if they hit uh, 95 degrees or 100 degrees, they, the collective of all the buildings cannot really bring the temperature down to something uh, comfortable. So some decision has to be made as to which buildings will be sacrificed in terms of reaching that threshold. Then you have emergency events, you know, like, uh, you know, from Oklahoma, there's a football event uh, every other Saturday in the fall, and that brings in thousands of more people and, and um, uh, adds uh, some stress to the, um, to the environment. And then, of course, if everything is all wired together, we're always having this fear of a cyber threat. On top of that, you know, the model has to be adaptable. And as an example over here, for instance, uh, at least at Georgia Tech, there is a easily a 1,000 people growth per year. So that makes the, um, uh, the whatever facilities we put in place to be under stress. This little uh, icon over there, Farouk, I don't know if you have visited Georgia Tech, but this is the CODA building. It's a 255 uh, tall uh, buildings right across from the Georgia Tech Hotel by Barnes & Noble. The, the, the icon in the middle is showing the supercomputer center that does all the supercomputing, and then they have rented it out to companies and so forth. So Georgia Tech is technically responsible for the load that this is creating, both in terms of electricity and water and gas and, uh, and infrastructure. And, and the moment you plop a building like this, it pretty much immediately breaks the, the model that, that was built. Then you have people always proposing new ideas. As an example here, you can have photovoltaics for the purpose of getting some solar energy. Then you have, of course, engaged stakeholders and, and they all wanna participate and you might be able to influence their decisions and so forth, okay? If you go to, uh, to the next slide. So as we started taking the model apart, we realized that uh, somehow we have to peel those layers. So starting from the right-hand side, you start seeing here a slice of layers, okay? So we got a geographic information layer, a traffic and mobility layer, an energy layer for the uh, HVAC and for the electrical and the security, the services. So, um, so we, we're gonna start with the buildings and using GIS data, we're gonna create a rendering. And the reason why the rendering looks more like cartoonish compared to the actual pictures is because we're gonna play with colors and other um, effects to indicate, for instance, that a building is consuming more or less than another one. Maybe color can be useful for that. Then we try to identify all the data. And again, 
if you have ever attempted a problem like this, the data is never as um, clean as you want it to be. There, there tend to be a lot of noise in data gathered. Uh, there is no integrated way of fusing data. So that's another element that has to be overcome. And so in a sense, there's a lot of dirty work or busy work that has to happen before someone can even afford the luxury of seeing all their data in an integrated fashion. And then you got a couple of things going on. The first one is that after you do the data fusion, you can have what is called a data-driven approach in trying to figure out what is going on. It's almost like situational awareness. Um, and then if you have this data, you can use it to calibrate models for the purpose of forecasting events that have not been encountered yet. And they are not within the mix of, um, of the data that has been gathered in the past. So it's almost like an extrapolation. If you put the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, click a couple of times. Yeah, okay. So, so then as we started talking to them about this type of uh, formulation, it became very evident that the chief business officer and the people who were making the place run had very different uh, problems that they were encountering. Some of them were more short term, some of them were more longer term. So we felt that the best way to do is to kind of saw it as a horizon from present to future and trying to categorize what types of problems they're trying to solve and what is the objective function for it. So as an example over here, in running the campus smartly, the focus is in, in running the campus as is and improving it in terms of cost avoidance, energy savings, reliability, and the like. If you start going towards the future now, you start thinking about how to improve the campus, how to uh, improve its performance over time with the addition of new buildings and new technologies. So click again. So if we were to look at uh, the horizons now again, um, I'm going from situational awareness to operations optimization, to technology infusions, and then to strategic planning. And at the very bottom, there are different objectives here. Uh, I might be trying to monitor the campus intelligently to get into a point of self-optimization and creating a resilient campus to creating a virtual campus experimental facility where I can try different processes. I can see how humans will interface with it. And then in the long run, I could be doing global studies such as like um, how sustainable is the campus and how am I doing in terms of CO2 emissions? The other thing that is worth observing over here, those various cartoons in the middle is indicating that depending on who you're talking to, the, the tools that they need, the tools that they use, the interfaces that they have, the data that they want to see, the way they want to see it is very different. So you end up now differentiating and creating a product family of tools depending on, um, on the audience and, and their level of sophistication and the, and the types of questions that they're trying to answer. We've got the next slide. So, so as we started now going down the path of where's the data coming from, it became very evident that someone can do a macro level formulation uh, or they can do a meso or a micro level formulation. At the micro level, which is down at the level of a building, we found up to 10,000 different sensor endpoints. By the time you go up to the meso scale, when you start looking at uh, the buildings and the plants, there were about 20,000 streams at the, at, at the end point. So it's almost like 20,000 times 10,000. And then because uh, the CBO was looking at this at the macro level, you wanted some kind of an integration that was linking that type of data streams with whatever other decisions they were trying to make. So um, although since then we have done it at different levels, today I'm going to talk about the macro formulation and I'm going to give an example at, the, at a building level. Let's go to the next level. Next slide. Okay, so now we're going into a little bit of the theory over here. And um, as we were developing this representation of, the, of this uh, first digital representation and eventually digital twin, we're going to break it down into two phases, the descriptive phase, the diagnostic phase, a predictive and a prescriptive. In the descriptive, we're going to be asking, you know, um, what happened or what is happening right now? So the focus is on summarizing 
and visualizing historical data to provide those insights in the past and the present. It will provide necessary concept, context, and foundation for further analysis. And we're really, as I said, we're seeking the answer to what happens, what's happening right now. Go to the next slide. So to handle this, we had to look into, um, into the amounts of information and the types of information that was gathered. And the term big data, for instance, is appropriate here for this type of a formulation. First of all, if you look at the little diagram on the top, each group was using a different a set of tools and, and uh, di different databases. Those had to be organized, coordinated, harmonized, if you like, so that we can achieve data fusion. The next one is that there was not enumeration of the sensors that existed. Every building was done by a different builder. Uh, there was not a master plan as to how those things all kind of came together. So my researchers and students went off and actually created these dendrograms that starts with a campus and then it zeroes in into a building. And for every building, it keeps on opening and opening and opening until you get to the endpoints of every sensor that exists in that building. And if you look at the ends, they have those green, red, and sometimes it could be black. If you see red, something's not trending right. If it's black, it has stopped producing data. And then that links directly into um, a facility that Georgia Tech has where all the information is coming in and they're trying to protect it you know, from um, cyber, cyber attacks. So we we kind of work closely with them to, to get access to this information to, to help them understand it. Now, I mentioned a couple of things about clean data. No, go back for just a second. About clean data versus uh, noisy data. In the middle panel, that's exactly an example of, of faulty sensors. That's all, all of a sudden, the data will go back to zero. But in reality, there is no reason for that to be happening. So some intermittent effect or interference could have happened and what the correct set supposed to look like compared to what is being observed. And if someone doesn't do this cleaning up, they very easily lead to uh, erroneous results. So if you now look at the third panel, it kind of shows you the difference between a, a clean set and a, and a noisy set. So these are the days of the week from Monday to Sunday. This is a specific building and it kind of shows the separation between the times of the day and, and, and so forth. If you go to the next slide. And the same thing now is happening at multiple domains. So these are different interfaces of the campus in, in the form of a dashboard for a variety of different uh, objective functions. So the one on the left is about energy consumption. The next one is about safety, the number of incidents, crime or alcoholic consumption. The third panel is on CO2 footprint. And the last one is all the activity that is going on in terms of um, um, new buildings or reconstruction or innovation of buildings. Go to the next slide. So now we're moving to the diagnostics and that was like the drilling down into the data to try to identify correlations and dependencies and identify patterns for the purpose of identifying the causes. So the question here is why did it happen? So if we go to the next slide, I'm particularly excited about this slide over here, okay? So uh, let's start with the left side. The left side is showing the building that I'm on right now. And it shows um, the cooling system year round. So both uh, you know, winter and, and summer and spring and fall as in-betweens. Uh, it's, uh, it's around the clock from midnight to, to noon. And right now the se sensor is kind of noisy. So you can see I cannot see a pattern whatsoever. After some effort and some cleanup, you get the image in the middle that is kind of showing how the cooling is behaving around the clock during the summer, which is the uh, um, orange one, and during the winter, which is the blue one. So the first observation is, why am I cooling the building in the winter time? And it, it was a 1970s vintage type of problem. Sometimes they refer to as a dual use type of uh, ducting systems. It seems to be a rather inefficient building by today's standards. So then we're extrapolating now to the, or, or extending this to other buildings. So there are 
three new buildings that you see over there on the top, they're cooling towns and the bottom are kilowatt hours. But let's concentrate on the one that says CRB. This is, the, this is what a good building should look like in terms of consumption. So the first observation is that during the uh, winter time, I don't have a lot of consumption. So it, it's minimized as much as possible. It should only be used really in the summertime. And that's what that orange line is. And then we see that there is enough of an automation built in that after six o'clock when people supposedly go home, I'm shutting down the system. There is no need for it to be working as hard as it was during the day. And then if you look at other buildings, every building ends up having a very unique signature. It's almost like they have their own unique fingerprint, again, done by different entities, managed differently, occupied differently. But I can very easily take this information and I convert them and monetize them to find out where my biggest expenses are coming from and whether I need to renovate a building or even tear it down and start all over again. Okay, so that would fall under that category. Then we move in the third phase, the predictive. And as an example here is we're asking what is likely to happen. So it leverages the descriptive and diagnostic analytics to predict the future trends. So now we're moving away from data-driven approaches to building models and actually calibrating them. And if I calibrate them, it's almost like doing a baselining or calibration of, of a model. And in that case, what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go from uh, a one-time calibration into continuous gathering of data so that eventually I have the best representation of the system. If this was an airplane it was flying, I would be doing this all the time. Uh, for a campus, I don't have to do it, uh, you know, on, a, on an hourly or a daily basis. I can, I can um, update the model every time there's some major changes into uh, either increase of population or new buildings are coming into play or anything of that sort. If you put the next slide. So this is a representation of, of the campus. It's a, it's a dashboard. Um, INSIGHT stands for uh, the version that is doing the data driven. Right now we're looking at Foresight and Foresight is the one that is using the uh, uh, models to forecast the future. So if you look at the panels, it starts with um, an interface that you're dialing in what um, uh, utility you wanna track. So this is the one that does the, the electrical and the uh, chill water and, the, and so forth. You can navigate over buildings to tell you what kind of a building it is and, and how much it's consuming. Click again, Olivia. Um, from there, it goes into the dendrograms to get the information that I'm tracking on the right-hand side. And that can be done for minutes or hours or days or weeks. So we can eventually get to a point that I can see a trend. You put the next slide. And then um, you have to interface now with with other sources to get the data that you don't have with the data-driven approach. So in this case, let's say I'm looking at the, at the weather. We have an interface with NOAA to find out what is the weather gonna look like in the next uh, few days, weeks. Uh, obviously the closer you come, the more accurate it will be. It will determine the temperature. It will determine the atmospheric pressure and so forth, humidity. And on that basis, that is fed into the, into the model and it, from there, it's led to an optimization to find out what's the most efficient way to run uh, the entire campus. Also think of it this way. If every building is optimized as every, per, every entity that delivered a, a building to your campus is proclaiming, almost by definition, we have created a suboptimal campus as, as a whole. So you're trying to take control since all of them belong to the university and try to find a way of how to manage it almost like a, like a fleet, like all, all the vehicles. In this case, all the buildings are actually belonging to one entity. So let's click on uh, the next one. That's the prescriptive one. And, and in this case, we are acting, we're asking the question, how to act in response. And the way we're using this is to, to have the environment built and bring the decision makers. The decision makers can be upper management or they can be maintainers subject them in a wargaming scenario, if you like, to a variety of different threats, and then see what kind of solutions they're recommending and then play them out 
And the ones that they are more uh, effective, they become part of their playbook. So the next time around, someone can very easily declare that we're under a given code, and then they automatically the maintainers know what to do. Okay, and, and go and fix it. You click again. So when we're talking about this model-based scenario exploration, I have an example here of energy demand versus supply. Just to give an example, we have a calibrated physics-based set of models that they use to plan these playbooks and re responses. So as a step one, we can say, given a weather forecast and cooling demand, how should plant chillers be optimally staged? Then you can ask questions in a scenario based that if a chiller went offline unexpectedly, where does it make sense to curtail the load? So the value proposition can be optimization of efficiency. You can create playbooks for resilient response, or you can solve it as a multi-criteria type of a problem. Okay. So this is a depiction. It's a little bit of a movie, and I thought that that, that might be useful for you to see. Um, if we had a live demo, we have a big screen, and then people come in and we show it to them. But this is the, the tool foresight. The icons that you see in the middle are actually different buildings of, of Georgia Tech. I have access to it. I can rotate it. I can, I can look at it from, from different perspectives. And we have a GIS interface that you can dial in any campus, really, or any site around the world. Right now, we're looking at metadata. We're trying to find out what kind of buildings they are and what's their purpose. So when I do comparison side by side of a, a, a buildings that they're alike, I can pull them together. I'm looking here at metadata that, that might exist on these on this, um, specific buildings. I can look at their age. So the, the higher the color, the older the building is. Then I can look at where is my electrical network and how the buildings are connected to each other and what would that be. Then I can look at the chill water. I can also look you know, at combining both of those together. So if I'm doing any utilities work, I, I can avoid those areas. Or I, if I wanna minimize any type of rework, I can go and look at it um, you know, from that perspective. And I can zoom in, of course, and all that, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so how is this used? This is again in the data-driven approach. So we got, we're looking at kilowatt hours. We have a Pareto plot over here of the buildings that consume the most at a specific point in time. So that dial over there that says March of 2017 is telling us for that month, it could be done by week, by day, by, by year and the like. So obviously, you know, when you have a football event, the stadium becomes red. The other days of, of the week or whatever, you know, there, there's nothing happening at the stadium. Uh, so this is the manual interactive mode, right? When you're trying to communicate points to people and show them uh, how you're doing it, why you're doing it that way. Or, um, but um, once all those things are all stitched together, you let the, um, uh, the, the computer kind of look at all the options and, and give you recommendations. And then you put them side by side and you comment. This is the dendrogram that I was talking about. It's, it's opening up here, specific building. So one of the more newer ones have a lot more sensors. So we're picking up the one that is directly linked to that. That's uh, the Clough building, if you remember, Farouk. And that opens up, you know, um, and of course, you know, every one of those opens up and opens up. And in the end, we end up to the endpoints. And if I see a red one, something is happening. Uh, if I click in any one of those, it's giving me the signal that is being connect, collected directly in real time. And I can specify the amount of time uh, that I would like that signal so I can see you know, the trend that, that is being uh, put together. Okay, so yeah. So if we can go maybe to the next slide, this one plays for five minutes here, so yeah. So interesting enough, once we had all that formulation together, uh, IARPA came to us and they were very interested um, in this notion, you know, like it, it, it's not every day that you have all the data available and you have integrated it. And I sold them, Farouk, on the idea that maybe Georgia Tech can be like, an ex like a case study, an like experimental apparatus, almost like a living experiment where certain behaviors can actually be um, experimented. You know, like you, you 
um, change the behavior or influence the behavior of people. It could be from how they use the buildings or how they evacuate them, depending on what layer we're talking about. So we did a series of exercises with them uh, towards this notion of a, of a living test bed. The vision of the test bed was create a digital twin of a, of a virtual test facility, calibrated models updated with real conditions to plan and run virtual experiments. And then we have a real test facility that is instrumented, which once again, you can use it to calibrate, but also to, to get new information. So the questions to be addressed there was like, with, with the campus as your test bed, how would you design living experiments to characterize the complex uh, interactions between technology, infrastructure, and people? So it's relevant to understanding smart cities, uh, mobility systems, um, even human space habitats, which is another um, major initiative these days, we you know, by NASA. If you had data, you know, like what data do you want? How many sensors? Where would you put them? What would they be collecting and so forth? Okay, so you go to the next slide. So um, as a zoom in example now, we're gonna go not at the macro level, but at the building. Before we were just looking at the endpoints. Now we're gonna look what's happening inside the building. And it so happens that the uh, Art Blank who owns the Falcons in uh, Atlanta United and was one of the, um, co-owners of uh, Home Depot, uh, he donated money to Georgia Tech to create a net positive building. It was to be net positive in water and net positive in energy. And this was a fairly ambitious project because the previous attempts to a building like this happened in places that were not as hot as, and humid as uh, Georgia was or Atlanta. And Candida, which is the name of the building, is actually the initials of his three kids. So um, the foundation put a little wrinkle in the whole thing here by saying that if Georgia Tech cannot prove in, within a year of operation that the building is indeed net positive, Georgia Tech must return back $4 million of the money that was given to them. So immediately they reached out to us and said, okay, we, we don't want to return back $4 million. So we got to figure out what is going on. And in this case, the building didn't exist. It's a little bit of a stretch to create a digital twin of something that doesn't exist. So the first step was to do a forecast of what is this building and how will this building be utilized? And obviously you're trying to inform people, administrators who will make decisions to perhaps um, not do certain things that will put this whole thing into jeopardy, like depending on how they use it and how many people they put in there and, and, and so forth. So we try to, to create an environment to predict it. And now we're in the phase where the building does exist and we're getting the data to truly calibrate it and demonstrate that indeed um, this is going to be um, the case. The building um, is actually, uh, yeah, that's the building on, on the very top. It it's, it's a, has a set of new energy technologies from uh, solar panels to heat recovery chillers. Um, there is um, a, an element of forecasting where there's a lot of sensing. Um, there is a, a set of technologies proposed for how to preserve the water. So for instance, uh, it's an ancient old um, principle of cisterns. So every time there is rainwater, the water is actually collected and then it will be used with some treatment to, to you know, utilize for the toilets and for you know, other, other purposes of that type rather than having potable water coming in. But in this case, we had to create models of every aspect of it. And then by analogy, we'll see how other buildings, what were they utilizing, what's the state of the art, use that data for calibration. So the forecasts are a little bit more accurate. And then we did a series of um, models to, um, uh, depict uh, human behavior uh, from um, where do they congregate and if there was an emergency, how do they evacuate and so forth. Okay, so you go to the next slide. So, so the real building is then subject to conditions such as temperature, relative humidity, rain and wind, solar irradiances, occupancies, and various loads. 
to see how it performs sustainably, you know, in terms of indoor air quality, energy production and consumption, water production and consumption, thermal comfort and the like. And then the building was instrumented and these are all different tools that the various providers of technologies the same site the building were using to, because in their own minds they were doing an optimization of the systems. We try to integrate the outputs from all those to get the, the uh, actual uh, response from sensors and meters and compare it against the predicted response from the tools that they were used to model the, the various aspects of the, um, the problem. Go to the next slide. So this one shows a little bit, you know, how the, um, the different techniques are utilized here to support, let's say the descriptive part. Is the building performing as expected? And then you have a signal at the bottom showing measurements uh, against predictions. So that's the data acquisition and, and ingestion. If uh, not, why not kind of questions, click again. Then, uh, Predictive questions will be, does this building certify as net positive given its current trajectory? So what you saw over there is a, an energy depiction over time, uh, given historical data for what the temperatures will be on that time of the year. How might this building be operated differently? And finally, you know, what if, if I still have um, certified as net positive and all of a sudden have an interruption, what will happen? So for instance, during the COVID, we were able to see that indeed the, the demand was, was not uh, as high. So it's, that's the, the, the green line at the bottom compared to full occupancy. And the building was continuing to run as if it was in full of, of occupancy. So actually the model intervened, gave guidance to them and they went in and sat down a, um, a whole variety of different uh, functions and and um, um, uh, saved, uh, I think, something of the order of about $1,000 uh, per, per, per day or per week. Okay, so I'm going to now change gears and talk a little bit about model-based systems and how they're applied. So Dr. Fisher is going to lead us through this, and she's going to leave us in the end before we go into questions with some potential opportunities, you know, uh, if you're interested in topics in this domain. Thank you, Professor Maris. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk uh, some about some of our efforts, at least motivation, uh, towards the use of uh, model-based systems engineering to the implementation, the realization of digital twins. So the, the motivation for, for such an approach really stems from the, the shift of a number of industries uh, and agencies uh, towards digital transformation. And, and what we notice is that there are many challenges to the realization of digital transformation in general, but also the development and implementation of digital twins in particular. And, and for example, it's pretty well known that organizations and, and people and processes are commonly highly intertwined, uh, partly siloed, and that, has, um, that leads to uh, inefficiencies. It makes it hard to, for the systems to adapt, to change, or even scale up. Uh, in an agile manner. So digital transformation really independently of the industry that is concerned uh, really requires two elements to be successful. Uh, the first one is the ability to map uh, organizational objectives and requirements to the business and the IT functions, as well as the digital technologies that are included. The second uh, element that is needed is really the ability to assess, but also understand the benefits of digital technologies on the design, on the development and the operations of non-digital systems. And a key enabler to this is really the concept of digital twins, uh, which is defined as Professor Mavis mentioned as the virtual representation of a connected physical asset. So basically this calls really for approaches based on the concept of system architecture. Uh, and you have many enterprise architecture framework that exists that have been developed to help uh, characterize organizations, information process and technologies. And then the second is uh, enabler is model-based systems engineering, uh, which really serves uh, through the comprehensive integrated set of system models uh, as an authoritative source of truth uh, to help harmonize uh, the disparate uh, organizational, technical, and other stakeholder perspectives. So um, as we're moving forward in our journey of, of developing digital twins, uh, this is kind of the approach that we're now taking to make sure that 
we develop digital twins that um, meet the needs of the stakeholders that actually fulfill the purpose that they were meant to, to fulfill. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was, uh, I thought it would be interesting to speak a little bit about uh, digital engineering as a research uh, thrust, because it's not something that um, as academics, we, we hear about a lot. Uh, this is an, an area of research that is uh, industry and, and governmental agencies are focusing on a lot. But, uh, you know, I thought it would be interesting to also give an uh, an, uh, an academic perspective on some of our efforts as they relate to digital engineering in, in general. So um, digital twin is obviously one of the, the centerpieces of, of digital engineering. And as a consequence, the Department of Defense and, and specifically the Air Force that Professor Mavis mentioned, uh, along with many other entities, uh, have recently begun uh, incorporating digital twin technologies into their systems and in their programs. And so to be success, successful, uh, they are going to have to rely on a skilled workforce, and in particular, one that has developed a specific level of, of data literacy. Uh, meaning, for example, that you know, students or the, the workforce in general needs to be versed in data science, but also be able to read and analyze and synthesize data information. Uh, this uh, workforce needs also to be skilled uh, and uh, have some level of, of technological literacy, uh, meaning being able to incorporate intelligence uh, into the physical tools and the objects they design and they build. And finally, uh, an element of uh, human literacy, and in particular, the ability and the willingness to connect and, and communicate with other people. Um, so, you know, the issue here is, uh, is that, you know, it's pretty widely acknowledged that engineers that are entering the workforce today have very little awareness of digital engineering topics or the concept of digital twin and digital thread. And, and we cannot really blame them because uh, realistically we're asking them to fill jobs that didn't even, didn't even exist 10 years ago or to fill jobs that have been uh, digitally transformed and are gonna require new skill sets. So really this brings us to, you know, as, as an academic lab and, and myself as a division lead is, you know, uh, and, and one of the questions that have been openly asked by government entities and, and industry leaders, which is how do we address the digital engineering uh, knowledge gap and develop a workforce that will be able to support uh, digital engineering initiatives and activities across industry and government. So uh, to, to to support uh, the, the, um, the development of a digital engineering workforce, it, it is uh, important to understand really what digital engineering is about. And digital engineering in its very essence is concerned with advancements in computing, in modeling, in data management, in uh, analytical capabilities to help improve the practice of engineering. And it's an area of research that are gonna require to develop skills uh, that are the intersection of systems engineering, computer science, software engineering, and social, social sciences. Um, and then a lot of the applications of digital engineering are not 100% aerospace uh, focused either. So as a matter of fact, uh, our in digital engineering division within the SDL uh, has been tackling problems related to energy, like Professor Mavris mentioned through the example of the smart campus, um, at the, again, campus level, building level and the like, uh, but also manufacturing, transportation, smart cities, um, infrastructure and the like. Uh, so I wanted to speak a little bit about um, some of the active uh, areas of research that I see. Uh, some of them we are currently pursuing, others we're starting to, to look into. Uh, but those I think would be, you know, if we were to look into the development of uh, a workforce of the future for digital engineering, those are kind of themes and areas of research that I think are, are, are relevant. Um, the first one is uh, really speaks to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, MBC approaches to, uh, to digital twin definition, development, implementation. And, and this stems from the fact that the development of digital twins is, is very much often characterized by a, a lack of problem framing, where you have most of the efforts that um, to develop digital twins that rely on uh, ad hoc approaches, where you start with building models without properly framing the problem. And that leads to a number of issues, starting with uh, poor model calibration, because you don't have the data available to actually calibrate your model. Uh, but also a lack of uh, interoperability and model reusability. And more importantly, as I mentioned earlier, 
It also leads to the development of models that provide a, a solution to the wrong problem and consequently are going to fail to address the core questions that the digital twin was intended to answer. Uh, the se second challenge that we see in the development of digital twin is that um, they, the, the development and their implementation lack standardization and have a tendency instead to rely on, on bespoke methods and, and technologies, uh, which in turn is going to lead to a lack of consistency in their descriptions and their implementation. And so because this is where we see the potential and benefit for implementation of MBAC, uh, but also enterprise architecting approaches to support the development of, of digital twinning and, and the like. Um, the other area of research that we, we see of value uh, relates to the development of methodologies for digital twins, uh, calibration and validation. So really digital twins are, are developed for the purpose uh, of supporting or inform uh, some kind of future decision or action, uh, which means that they're gonna have to be trusted as a source of information. And establishing the confidence uh, in those twins is gonna require extensive qualification of the tools that you're gonna be using. And that also you're gonna obviously includes uh, verification, validation, but also uncertainty quantification. And so additional research here is needed on how to calibrate digital twin, when to calibrate them, when do you need to update them, uh, with data from the physical assets. So we have some efforts uh, in that area as well. A third area of, of research uh, relates to digital engineering for product qualification and certification. So that area of research really stems from the realization that the polarity of testing uh, needs to shift towards the digital, uh, meaning that testing is not a phase anymore. Uh, it's something that is done continuously to help calibrate and validate a, a, a digital entity of some sort. So when in the past we were graduating from models to physical testing, uh, we should now do physical testing to graduate to models. And there's a lot of work here to be done on understanding what role digital engineering uh, and digital twins in particular can play in supporting uh, product qualification and certification. Uh, and especially as we move towards uh, certification by analysis, because really the true benefits of a digital twin is ultimately to be able to reduce the physical testing and improve this, the decision competence and tractability. Another area of research is, is systems or systems digital twins. So we showed you examples really of uh, um, digital twin of a system. Uh, the, the complexity comes in now when you look at the system or system perspective, understanding you know, the impact that um, having different level of fidelity of digital twins when combined together, uh, have on the, your ability to make decisions. There's an element of, of data fusion as well uh, that comes into play. And again, uh, there is a lot of uh, application to this idea of systems of systems, um, digital twins from you know, the ability to do some wargaming exercises or even at the smart city level. Uh, so again, uh, this is also very, mu very much an active area of research. Um, another one is the realization of lifecycle digital threads. Uh, so digital thread really is, you can be thought as uh, some kind of an enterprise level uh, analytical framework that is going to link together all the data and all the models that have been generated across the product lifecycle or whatever um, asset that you're looking at. And, and really the digital thread here is key to enabling that digital twin interconnectivity. And really, if you think about it, you cannot really have a digital twin without having the digital thread underneath it. So. The, the challenge here is that uh, there's no really standard or reference model uh, for um, the implementation of digital thread. Uh, this is still a, a very much an, a, a active of area of research. Uh, there are also a lot of work that needs to be done around the topic of knowledge management, uh, configuration management, consistency management to help enable the digital thread uh, as it has been envisioned by the industry. Uh, another element and area of research is that of digital curation for design analysis of aerospace systems. And a, a critical aspect of the digital transformation of the US Air Force is really developing best practices and tools to help accelerate technology transition and, and capability development for the warfighter. So one of the objectives really is to be able to identify and curate um, aerospace system design and analysis artifacts that have been generated uh, through predictive modeling and simulation or ground testing or flight testing activities. And really what we're looking at here is, you know, the development of, of systematic model-based systems engineering processes 
uh, to help evaluate the feasibility of reusing legacy design analysis elements of, uh, on emissions, for example, but also looking at the concepts of <clears throat> design and, and their inheritance. Uh, and, and the impact that product reuse has on cost and schedule. Um, another area which is here open, of open system architecture um, and really the goal of, of those open system architectures is, is to describe an approach that is focused on uh, using modular designs, uh, sets of universal hardware standards, any type of common software to help ensure the openness and, and component uh, interoperability. So the idea here is to allow for easy, rapid integration of new design technologies into existing systems. And again, there are tons of applications that falls under that. Um, and this is also something that we're looking into. And then last but not least is, you know, the application of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you know, things like meta-machine learning, geometric learning, physics and probability learning to support uh, engineering problems, but also systems engineering problems. So, Anything that deals with, you know, sensor data fusion uh, in the face, for example, when you're trying to fuse data that um, is high fidelity and, and data with low fidelity, you know, and, and being able to understand how that uncertainty in the data propagates when you fuse the data together. Uh, anything that relates to data-driven decision-making, uh, the ability to uh, look at your decisions and make sure that you can actually trust it. So trust it. So there is an element also of, you know, um, trustworthiness of, of your machine learning models that is also a very active area of research. Uh, the la another one is multi-scale system for systems and in particular uh, work around the development of a, a dynamic system of system architecture that can scale uh, itself as the operational environment is going to change um, and the ability to understand you know the type of strategic trade-off that you would that would exist between uh, the scalability of the system, but also the performance, the cost, or even the operability and functionality. Um, and then uh, another area of where we see a lot of application of the IML is around the topic of uh, automated knowledge extraction and representation. So that's really uh, all I had for you today in terms of you know um, speaking a little bit on on this kind of digital engineering as a research thrust, uh, where I see you know. Um, most of the value and the time being spent uh, to accelerate and, and support the development of uh, this digital engineering workforce. Thank you. Okay, so, so that was the end of the prepared material. I, I hope that um, that kind of made sense and we're very glad to take any questions you might have. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So I think uh, this work is super amazing and I love seeing the visualization. It's really bringing the models to life. Um, I expect both of you uh, do a lot of work with those who aren't engineers, people such as policymakers, uh, you know, at Georgia Tech, I'm sure you've got, you know, the university. Um, how do you uh, introduce and explain these models to people and how do you um, help them know what it can and can't do and how, how much they can trust these models. Okay, so we got two issues over here. The first one is that the vision that it was pushed forward by the chief business officer was not really espoused by any of the people who were doing the work at the lower levels, okay? So when you saw over there that I had different products for different entities, it was a solution to that problem. It's almost like we had to earn our citizenship a little bit by saying, look, we're going to solve some real practical problems that you have in return for your data, in return for um, you explaining to me what even is the problem. Because there is a little bit of, um, we don't speak the same language, right? They, they have a mm -hmm. terminology that they use that we as academics don't use it. It's almost like um, a layman's language, right? Of, of things that they do. Uh, esoteric or idiosyncrasies in terms of the tools that they're using and the like. So in the end, you end up customizing the interfaces to what problems people have, the way they see the problem. So there's not one solution for every layer, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, of course, is that um, it took us probably three years 
to earn the trust that we're not going to do something crazy with the data or, <laughs> you know, make decisions that they're messing them up or, you know, stuff like that. You know? but, but you're very right. Um, different communities, different perspectives like to see the problem in a specific way, which entering into the into this domain, you don't know a priori what that is, you know, it has to be discovered. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's really uh, cool. And I'm sure there's different ways you can sort of customize those solutions. You know, engineers might want one thing to see more data, whereas, you know, other people might not care as much about the hard numbers. And so I think that's a really good response. Thank you. Yeah, and to, and to be honest with you, we had an event, the chief business officer brought 36 other chief business officers from other universities because he was trying to promote the, A, that this capability exists or it is within the realm of possible, motivating them to do something similar. When you look at the chief business officer, he's looking at the totality and he wants to see a coffee table and people are coming in and he's trying to demonstrate that versus the others one very practical type of solutions thanks Russia? yeah is there anyone else who would want to ask dr mavis a question dr naidu maybe yeah <clears throat> so thanks for giving the opportunity uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dimitri and Olivia for an excellent presentation, very comprehensive, very detailed. And uh, mine is not a question, rather I would like to share something what we have been doing in this area. Mm -hmm. About two to three years back, we started uh, um, working on this concept of digital twin. And two proposals uh, we submitted. Uh, one was an internal propo proposal for a sister um, company which is, um, which, which is actually JK Tire. So we make tires and we acquired this company in Mexico called Tornel for the North American tire market. And uh, we have a very big uh, tire production facility in India in, in a place near Bangalore, uh, Mysore. And there, there was a project requirement and we gave the solution. Actually, we wrote a feasibility study we conducted for a few months and we submitted a proposal for a digital twin for a uh, inspection out of roundness of tires. Uh, there's a equipment which required a periodic inspection and that we proposed a digital twin for that. Another project was with a startup company and that was, uh, the project was called Crop Digit Digital Twin. And uh, we were doing a project in collaboration with the Indian Space Research Organization. And the idea was to capture the satellite images of crops uh, because India had launched a very huge and ambitious uh, crop insurance program. And that was very susceptible to corruption because the field uh, officers will go to the field and check the crop, whether it has been cut or whether it has been not been cut, what was the crop, all these things. So we wanted to back it up with a satellite imagery of the crops. And we called that project actually the Crop Digital Twin Project. And uh, the feedback what we when we went to the review committees and uh, you know the the people who give the funding, like we got some internal funding and small funding, and we managed to do the feasibility studies. But when we went for the real large funding, um, they were they were very apprehensive about the technology itself because they have not heard of it. It's still in infancy, so. A lot of work needs to be done in many of these applications to convince the decision makers and funders to actually fund. So this is my experience um, as far as I have dealt one with the industry and one with the, the government funding agency. So I, I fully uh, am very enthusiastic about working on these, um, these areas. So crop, uh, crop monitoring has a very huge potential and it has been successfully demonstrated in many North American uh, uh, um, contexts, uh, particularly where the uh, area is very large and can be 
captured normally by drones. They do in North America by drones, but we were trying to do by satellite, which was much ahead of the trend, I believe. That's Sir, the reason Jyoti, why they could not. Jyoti, are you, are you saying that there's an opportunity for Dimitri to work with you? Because you've yeah, just possibly. been doing. So yeah, yeah, possibly. So we will be looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll be looking for the next opportunity when we write a project proposal. Maybe it has to be in a larger scale and an international scale. And there so I am open. To. So I suggest that you email Dimitri and uh, uh, establish a working relationship with him. And perhaps if Dimitri is interested, suddenly uh, it can it, uh, you can proceed with it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Anybody you. else? <clears throat> Well, let me, let me tell you, Dimitri and Olivia, this was absolutely fascinating. And uh, I, I was particularly impressed with a few things, one, uh, with many things, but the ones I will talk, uh, I will refer to is that on slide seven, you have defined a digital twin. And that definition I think is superb uh, because everybody has their own definition of a digital twin. And typically what people do is they say, hey, guess what? Because I've written a computer program, it's a digital twin. So I think what you've done here is, is superb. And, it, and, and the end where you came along, uh, 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 I mean, Dimitri, you explained the different setups. And Olivia, you came along and you tied it up very nicely because it fits into the definition of a digital twin as to what you've done. So these research issues that you put together fit, fit exactly into the definition of the digital twin. The second thing on slide 10, uh, you have given an example of a multi-echelon network. Uh, what you have is a multi-echelon network. And Janet and I are interested in the design of fail-safe networks. And we have a monograph that was published in 2018 on designing fail-safe networks. Mm. The second thing, when you have a, uh, the multi-echelon network, your connection, what I liked very much was the interaction between the various echelons that you uh, dealt with. And, and it is it, the, the issue here, is that you're dealing with information so you can make that connection. But when you get into design, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that connection is not that easy. So we are interested in being able to model the connections between those multi-echelon networks. And in 2020, we published a book, a monograph again, on how, how uh, uh, you can manage, uh, 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 do dynamic management of systems where the information is not just from one domain. Okay. The, 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 uh, the, so, so slide 10, 11 uh, uh, deals with this multi echelon stuff. And slide 12 was evolving, where you brought in the notion of an evolving uh, cyber physical <coughs> system. And that I think is absolutely phenomenal because people talk about cyber physical social systems in a point in time, but what you brought in is the idea of evolving. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the way in which you're handling it is on slide 27, where you, it was absolutely superb to watch, uh, where you talked about the playbook and gaming and the foresight uh, da dashboard. So those are my comments. And I would certainly like to continue the dialogue with you yeah. uh, in terms of uh, where we go and what we are doing. Absolutely. I think, Farouk, that this is the beginning of... Um of an entire new field, right? It's uh, yeah. so much to be done here, right? And everything that you say is really spot on. You know, you there, there are techniques that they're lacking when you're talking about the design of it, and it is a fail-safe system. And yes, by all means, we, we should be looking into this <clears throat> together, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Sir Roshan? Yeah. Um, um, I think we're almost there with our time. So if anybody has a last question to ask Dr. Dr. Fisher or Dr. Mavrus. Um, so I have a comment uh, for Olivia. Uh, uh, you're, I, I understand you're a research faculty. Are you planning to become a regular faculty person somewhere? Can't hear you. Sorry, double mute. Uh, right now, I intend to remain at Georgia Tech. Uh, I very much love the opportunities I have here at uh, ASDL. Uh, but as Professor Mavis mentioned, uh, looking forward to uh, opportunities to collaborate on some of those topics, definitely. Thank you. Russian. 
Yeah. Um, uh, if nobody has a question, then Professor Mystery, final words are yours, and then. <laughs> well, uh, Olivia and uh, Dimitri, this is absolutely uh, gorgeous, <laughs> and uh, you have made my day today in terms of polishing my mind and expanding my horizons. And it's absolutely superb and in, uh, uh, inspirational to see what you're doing out here. And so thank you both very much. And uh, Janet and I will be in touch with you. Sounds very you. good. It was my, our pleasure to be with you today. Best thank of you luck. So much. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank Take care. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.